So let's let's dive right in, and uh, we'll talk about concentrations first. That's one of the first things in the chapter. Should have watched the video, of course. And you had a quiz this morning, right? How was that? Not too bad. All right. Learning goals. Be able to carry out calculations involving molarity. So this is the one main. Um, I guess there is this this math here. I'm sorry. There is there is the calculations here on molarity. Um, we've done mole, we've done moles already, but now we're just going to stick it in solution. That's all. It's just going to be moles per given volume of solution. Um, once you learn molarity, you should be able to calculate the amount of solute needed, the volume needed, the molarity given the solute and volume, whatever. Um, however, the question is worded, you should be comfortable with manipulating molarity. Predict products of reactions. So we have to start to be able to like, be able to start to see kind of what we would expect to form as we put certain reacting species together. And that comes with time. It comes with more and more exposure to different chemical reactions and different chemical species. But ultimately, we want to start to get a feel for predicting some of these things that we might see form that you're doing in labs, some of these things in labs. Get you exposed to acids and bases and start to be able to identify these. It's kind of difficult at this point. So you start taking organic chemistry and you learn a little bit more about, you know, what are acidic hydrogens and which are not. Uh, but at least we'll, we'll do it for the inorganic acids pretty much exclusively, except for one organic acid. And then the last part is these oxidation states. Um, and these are kind of like theoretical charges that we're going to play around with and, and get a feel for it because it's going to help us to really figure out what's going on in a chemical reaction. We'll be able to look at a reaction and figure out, hey, oh, electrons are being transferred from this species to this species. Um, and these oxidation induction reactions, I think I mentioned because I did the outline already on Tuesday. If you weren't here Tuesday, if you didn't watch the video, um, that this is a huge class of reactions. I mean, most of the reactions in your body are oxidation reduction reactions. Combustion reactions are oxidation reduction reactions. So it's a big, broad class of reactions. And if you want to take biochemistry, I know there's a lot of biochemistry majors these days. It's a popular, um, popular uh, major. Um, you know, so much of biochemistry is, you know, all your metabolism, all this stuff is our oxidation reduction reactions. All right, so you watched the video, you've done some reading. Are there any questions first about anything you had with solution concentration? I think your book talks about different ways you can, you know, uh, report concentration. I think I focused mainly on just molarity. That's pretty much what we use in chemistry. True story. Um, after I graduated as an undergraduate, I had a biology degree, not a chemistry degree. And I went on interviews. Um, and one of the interviews was Einstein Institute in, in Philadelphia. And the uh, principal investigator there, the PhD scientist that was interviewing me, it was, for, it was his lab. He asked me, if I asked you to walk into the lab right now and make me up a 3.5 molar solution of sodium chloride, could you do it? And I sat there for a while and said, should I lie or should I be honest? <laughs> I was taught to tell the truth. So I said, to be honest with you, I'd probably have to refer back because I was a biology major, and to be honest with you, once you're done with Gen Chem, and even in Gen Chem, we never have you guys actually make up solutions. You know, we give you the solution. To get into research, that's different. All my students make up all, all of their solutions in my lab. Um, so I was honest with them, needless to say, I didn't get the job, but um, I got a better job. I, I, I went to Fox Chase Cancer Institute and interviewed there and got that job. And I was glad I got that one. But um, but a true story. I mean, it was something he expected, you know, me to be able to do, having a, an undergraduate degree in science. Um, so it was a reasonable question. And um, it is something that, that's used tremendously, molar solutions, concentrated solutions, making up solutions for lab, analyzing solutions. This is a huge part of, of, of chemistry, science in general, uh, especially environmental science. And it's very simple. It's moles of solute per liter of solution. That's all there is to it. Now, solution is the large volume, right? It's the whole thing. You have your solute and your solvent, and the whole thing is the solution. I think I mentioned this in the video. I think it's introduced early on 
even in this in this textbook, maybe back in chapter two where they first mentioned this. I can't remember, but anyway, those are terms you should be familiar with. Um, so obviously, if you're given a molarity, you should be able to tell me how many moles are in there. You can even back calculate how many grams are in there, right? You're always going to be using the molar mass. So if I want to know, you know, a, a, uh, a molar solution of sodium chloride, well, you're going to take sodium and add it to chlorine. That's my molar mass. And you get like 59 or so. I need 59 grams in one total one liter of solution to have a one molar sodium chloride solution. That's all this is. Okay. Any questions on that? So we'll simply just do a calculation rather than, you know, spending much more time in this. If you've had a video, you've got some reading, let's just do a calculation. What is the molarity of an 18 solution prepared by adding 36.5 grams of barium chloride to enough water to make 750 mils of solution? Go ahead and start crunching this out right now. And you can just do a quick estimate of your molar mass. You don't have to use exact, you know. Firing's 137, chlorine's 35.5. Use that. Give an answer, raise your hand. The molar mass is right around 208. Yeah, what'd you get? 0 0.23? Okay, good. So we've got um, 36.5 grams in, and I'm going to convert this to liters right away, divided by 1,000, 0 0.7500 0 liters times, and I want to get rid of the grams, so 208.23 grams in one mole, and that gives us about 0 0.23 moles per liter, which is 0 0.23 capital M molarity. Okay. I always like to put, you know, my mass over my vine. That's the solution I have right here. So I just write it like that. Question. The book does talk about parts per million. That's real important in environmental chemistry. A lot of your water quality reports, things like that, report chemicals in parts per million, parts per billion, stuff like that. Um, but I'm not gonna talk about that really. It's not something we use typically in just chemistry. It's used in environmental chemistry, but. So now we might be asked like the mass of a solute. How many grams of aluminum nitrate are required to make 500 mils of a 0 0.0525 molar aqueous solution? I'm giving you the molar mass here. It's 213, so you have to spend time adding that up. Silver is about 27 and then you've got three times the uh, 
nitrogen. So, and then three times your oxygen. So this is aluminum nitrate. It's aluminum's in group three. Nitrate's a polyatomic ion. That is minus one. So you wind up with three nitrogens and that's a mistake. I just realized, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm sorry, I got the three on the outside. Three nitrogens and six. Sorry, nine oxygens. <laughs> So this molarity again just asks for the solute instead of in this case you're given the molarity. You can raise your hand if you get an answer. Did you get 5.6 grams? Also 5.6 grams. Okay, so we've got, we've got, 0 0.0525, and I'm going to write it as moles per liter because I can see the units, moles per liter, and then I want to get rid of the liters. So I'm going to say 0 0.5000 liters times this 213.0 grams per mole. Looking at my units. Moles cancel out, liters cancel out. It gives me my grams, and we said 5.6 grams. It was just, just again, dimensional analysis. It's why we introduced dimensional analysis in chapter two. It's very useful with all the different calculations you can do in Gen Chem that don't necessarily have formulas always to plug into. Just take it and look at what you have and where you're going. I used to like to write, you know, down here what I have over here. An equal sign what I'm after, you know, I've got to get to grams and I'm starting with moles per liter and liters. Just move across one step at a time to get rid of your units and get to grams. Question. All right, lots of times we get standard solutions. Um, a lead standard solution, you know, something like this. I think I mentioned in the video that sometimes we can get standard solutions from like EPA, places like this. And you have to make sure that whatever procedure you're using in your lab, you can get, get an evaluation and an analysis that equals the concentration that's supposedly, you know, in this. So I can have my students make a series of dilutions with this, run it through a procedure, and analyze it and have to make sure that they get the concentration that what we would predict calculation wise based on how we diluted this. So what this is here is, and I think I mentioned in the video, if I take a substance and I simply dilute it, the initial moles equals the final moles. That's what this means up here. All I'm doing is diluting it. So I've got a beaker with a certain number of particles in it, moles, and all I do is add some more water to it. Well, the number of particles hasn't changed, right? At least the number of solute particles, number of solvent particles has changed. But the, the solutes, what we're talking about here, the lead in this case, this is lead suspended probably in like a nitric acid solution, there usually are. Um, so you can use this idea that mo the initial moles equals the final moles. And since we just did molarity, we know that molarity times volume equals moles because molarity is moles per liter times liters gives me moles. So that's all we're doing. We're saying moles equals moles. The initial moles equals the final mole. So you can use that to solve it. These are very simple calculations, quite frankly. My students typically never have much problem with this, either in the class or the lab. It's very simple. 
initial minus the final, you should be able to solve for any of these, depending on what, what you're asked. What's typically asked is, you know, hey, I've got this 1,000 ppm solution. I want a 25 ppm solution to work with to set up this experiment. And I need 500 mils of it. How much of that do I take? Right? That, that's the type of question that, let's see, type of question I would ask. So I tell my students, oh yeah, you need to make up 500 mils. So that's my final volume, 500 mils, right? And I need you to have a solution of 25 ppm. How much of that initial stock solution do you take? That's the V initial that we're after times, and in this case, it's going to be a thousand PPMs. It doesn't have to be molarity as long as the units are the same. You can do it with PPM too, because your units just cancel out. You can see that, right? So you can use this for molarity, you can use it for anything. Um, and we don't necessarily have to convert the milliliters to liters because the molarities cancel out. Your answer will be in milliliters, and that's fine. And then you solve that and it tells you how much you need. So it's just 500 times 25 divided by 1,000. So it becomes what? 12 and a half? Is that right? Uh, 12, 12 and a half mils, right? Is that right? 12.5? So it's just 25 times 500 divided by 1,000. So that means you would have to take 12.5 mils of your original stock solution, dilute it to a total volume of 500 mils, and then you would have a, a, a 25 ppm solution to work with. And I mentioned this the other day with the, in the out, when we were talking about the outlines, how you make up a solution, right? You always want to bring it up to final volume, make sure everything is dissolved. And of course, when you're doing one solution to another, you don't have to worry about dissolving it. But it's always good to mix it, you know, and get it dispersed. And then use something like uh, a little squirt bottle to get it right up to that line. This is a volumetric flask. It's only designed to measure out whatever that flask is, a 500 mil flask, 1,001, 250. You got all sorts in the lab. That's what it's designed to do. You can't measure less or more. It's that, it's not like a graduated cylinder, we can do anything. But these are very accurate, much more accurate than a graduated cylinder. The beakers are trash. Beakers are trash for measuring volumes. They're completely useless, literally. Um, they're only good for just, you know, if you're not concerned with, with making up a solution, you just need to say, put in, put in roughly, you know, 500 mils for a water bath or something. You don't care if it's 450, <laughs> right? But if you ever actually measured the volume in a beaker, put it up to the 50 mil mark and then poured it in a graduate cylinder, you'd be pretty shocked at how poor they are. They're not designed to be for measuring volume. Pipettes are really good. And volumetric pipettes are better than the graduated ones, just like volumetric flasks are better than graduated cylinders. All right, here's another example. Hydrochloric acid is typically transported in you know uh coated bottles so if they break they're protected because this stuff's really concentrated and dangerous 12 molar it's really strong okay spill that on you got problem what volume of this stock solution is required to make 500 mils of a 0.145 molar dilute solutions ahead and do that real quickly see what you get Some people use M1, V1 instead of M initial. Some people use concentrated and dilute. So if you see this in a future class with different subscripts, just treat it the same. So people use concentrated dilute, initial, final, or one and two. Doesn't matter, they're all the same. What'd you get? 6.04, confirmation for anybody? 6.04, so we've got B, did I write it out? No, I didn't, let's take V initial times 12.0 molar 
equals um, 500 milliliters, but I need to change the units times 0.145 molar. And we get, what was it? Six point what? Zero four. Thank you, milliliters. What's your first name? Shakira. Zero point six point zero four mils is what you need. That can get a little tricky in the lab to get that type of volume. But. Questions on dilution calculation. Okay. Not too bad. All right. Your book spends more time on this than me. I'd like to spend time. This is a really useful uh, concept here, and that's Beer's Law. But you'll get this in either bioanalytical or quant. And even if you take, if, even if you're a biology major, um, we use this for like in microclassics for measuring a density of like soul, cell cultures and growing bacteria and stuff like that. And that's the idea that, you know, the amount of light that transmits through a solution is directly proportional to the concentration of that solution, right? So if something has very low concentration, most of the light goes right through it. High concentration, most of it is, most of it is absorbed. So that's Beer's law. And you can actually create, what's nice is you make up standards and you make what's called a calibration curve or standard curve. And I know that word better is probably the more proper term, a standard curve, where you make up a bunch of concentrations. Just take my lead solution. The lead's not gonna work because that's not gonna, uh, that's a clear solution. You'd have to have, uh, um, you'd have to add something to that. So that's not gonna absorb any light at all. It's a clear lead solution. But let's say we got a solution like this, right? And I can make different, different dilutions of this, right? And then I can look at how the absorbance is Dependent, this is the independent, this is the independent variable, this is the dependent variable, right? The x-axis is always the independent variable, right? The other one depends, the absorbance depends on the concentration, so that is the y-axis, always, you always graph like that. Okay, so we've got the independent variable is the concentration, the dependent variable on the y-axis. We see how much absorbance we get for each concentration. We now have a standard curve and then someone can come to me with an unknown into my lab and say, hey, Dr. D, how much, whatever the solution is, how much of this stuff is in my sample? Oh, we're going to measure it right here, and we're going to get an absorbance, and then we're going to get that absorbance and use our standard curve, which is just a linear regression, right? Y equals mx plus b. You all know y equals mx plus b, right? We can use that standard curve to figure out, hey, What's the amount in that solution? Okay, that's, this, is the, this is the basic principle behind almost all instrumentation in analytical chemistry. It doesn't matter what, whether you're doing uh, liquid chromatography, gas chromatography, light absorption, some sort of IR technique. You're gonna have a bunch of standards if you're trying to determine a concentration of an unknown, right? And then you're gonna create your standard curve and then you're gonna take your unknowns and figure out how much is in all of this. So if I'm taking samples out in the river, my students are taking samples and we come back to the lab and analyze them. We gotta do a standard curve first, figure out whatever it is we're looking for um, to figure out how much is actually in those samples. You gotta have some sort of standard curve like this. All right, electrolytes. Questions. You had some information on a video. You've done some reading. Questions on electrolytes. Section 8.3 in your book, electrolytes and non-electrolytes. Everybody know what a strong electrolyte is? Megan, what's a strong electrolyte? Completely dissociates in this, in this solution, okay? completely ionizes in that solution. So that means when I put sodium chloride into water, it's pretty much all ions, okay? You get into the nuances of the chemistry of solution and people spend their careers doing this stuff and there's actually going to be some ion pairs in there and all of this, but we don't care about that. In general, we're looking at almost all of that is going to be sodium ions and chloride ions. I think I mentioned 
in the outline the other day that those sodium ions get attracted by the water molecules, right? With the oxygens pointed towards them because the oxygen is negatively charged due to the dipole of oxygen because it's a bent, right? With the dipole, that electronegativity difference. Do so you wind up with the six waters? We know this, six waters. That's the salvation sphere. There are six waters surrounding that sodium cation. There's actually a second salvation sphere typically. I'm only drawing one of the waters there. Now with the chloride ions, you have the hydrogens that are gonna to point towards it because those are positively charged. And they'll also have six spheres of water surrounding them. That's a strong electrolyte, but just because it's a salt that's, that is a positive and negative ion doesn't mean it's a strong electrolyte. We'll get to that towards the end of the chapter. There's some substances whose solubility is very low in water because the bonding is very strong. So most of it just settles to the bottom of the beaker still as paired up. Things like lead sulfide. Lead two sulfide, I should say properly, right? That's not very soluble at all. And I won't be able to conduct electricity with it because very few ions will be in solution. Why the bonding, bonding is just strong there, it doesn't come apart. Don't ask me to explain that to you. I teach some of this stuff in my 4,000 level chemistry course and even they have trouble with it. There's a lot of periodic chemistry, inorganic chemistry goes to explaining why things like lead sulfide are not very soluble in water, but sodium chloride is, okay? So for right now, just I'll give you some of that information a little bit. Um, some of it we've already been exposed to, you know, a little bit about lattice energy, right? And the bonding of the lattice energy that helps explain some of it, but just not all of it. And we learned that higher charges, stronger attraction typically, right? Um, also smaller size, stronger attraction, greater lattice energy. That helps to explain some of it, but not all of it. Um, a weak electrolyte would be something that only produces a small number of ions in solution. A non-electrolyte produces no ions. And I mean no ions. So like glucose. I mentioned this the other day during the outline. This is a sugar, the simplest sugars, right? C6H12O6. The diabetic, you know all about blood glucose, but in general, blood glucose is very important. This is a molecular compound. It doesn't have any metals in it, right? There's no ions. It's not a, not a metal from the left side of the periodic table like iron, chloride, or, or nickel, sulfide, things like this. It's all non-metals over here on the right of the periodic table, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen with the exception of hydrogen, of course, on the left, but we all know hydrogen's a non-metal. It interacts with the water molecules. That's what allows it to dissolve in the water. It has a high solubility, but it does not form ions. It's a non-electrolyte. So it will not conduct electricity, but it will dissolve in water readily. Where some things don't dissolve in water readily. What doesn't, give me an example of something you know in everyday life that doesn't dissolve well in water. Oil, right? You learn when you're, what? What's that? Sand, sand doesn't dissolve water either, right? You learn that type of stuff when you're really young, right? Oil and water don't mix. You're playing in your sandbox and you're pouring the sand in your bucket to water. The sand doesn't go into the water, right? So why doesn't oil and water mix, though? What's that? I can't hear you. Homo what? Uh, homo, uh, hydrophobic? Is that what you were trying to say? Okay, <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> Saying it's hydrophobic, it doesn't have ability to interact with water. So here's, let's just take something like this. It's easy to do, it's a short one. It's not really a component of oil, it's a smaller hydrocarbon, but, but just take something like this. I don't wanna keep going because you know, if you go to octane, just do, do that with eight carbons and you have octane, right? And that's gasoline. Okay, it's not oil. They're different size hydrocarbons, oil, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, they're all different. Um, but it doesn't have any dipoles, right? 
So there's no charge related to it like this does. And I can't draw that structure for you now um, from, the, from my head, glucose, I should be able to, but it's got rings and everything. So it's not that simple to draw. But know that you've got these little hydroxyl groups hanging off that give you these dipoles, okay? A little bit of a difference in electronegativity, right? With the oxygens and all that, that can interact with the water. This thing doesn't have any dipoles. These are all symmetrical. The electronegativity of these are so close, it doesn't interact well with water. So we say oil and water doesn't mix. It has a low solubility in water. So, so any sort of oil and gas components, things like this are non-electrolytes. You will see some discrepancy in how people talk about electrolytes. And that is some people will say, I hate that they do this, forget it. I'm not gonna even go there. It's not that common that people do it. Um, if it doesn't conduct electricity, it doesn't produce produ appreciable ions, just consider it a non uh, a weak electrolyte or a non-electrolyte, okay? All right. Let's introduce acids and bases. This is the Bronsted Lowry type of definition. Um, the Lewis definition, I think the old edition used to introduce it here, but now I, I couldn't find it. So I think maybe they reserve it to later. There's a later chapter where they introduce it. Um, I'm going to tell you the definition because it can be useful sometimes, but you don't have to commit it or anything. But when hydrochloric acid dissolves in water, it dissociates completely and ionizes and donates a proton to a water molecule to form a hydronium ion. Okay. You might say to me, you know, why the heck does this happen? <laughs> I mean, think about it. You know, water is a stable molecule, right? And it's the fluid of light that has to be stable, right? Why does it pick up a hydrogen ion? Well, the answer to all these questions I mentioned to you before is kind of stability, lower state of energy. The point is, if I put HCl into water, this is way too unstable to stay like that. So, so it's going to fall apart, and that hydrogen has to go somewhere. It's just a proton. Because a hydrogen ion, remember, the major isotope of hydrogen is this. How many neutrons does that have? Zero. Who said that? Houston, very good. Most people want to say one. No, it has one proton and a total of one proton and neutron. So it only has one proton. And of course, it has an electron, right? So that means that this, all this is, it's lost its electron. It's just a proton. There's no neutron even there. You can't have a proton just hanging out in solution. <laughs> it's not stable, okay? In plasmas, that's okay. In a star or a plasma light, there's high energy particles flying around, but not in chemistry beakers, okay? Not in the just general environment, maybe in the upper atmosphere, things like this. You have a lot of charged particles like that. I mean, charges flying around like that. So it's too stable to stay together. The hydrogen has to go somewhere. Hey, you know what? Water's got a couple lone pairs there. So it picks it up. Okay, no problem. It doesn't mean that that, that that species, this hydronium ion, is more stable than water. It just means in this situation, that, high, that proton needs to go somewhere, and that's the place for it to go. So this, what we're saying is, when you look at chemical reactions, you have to say that if it's favored in this direction, we've drawn an arrow, it means that these species over here, the products, are more stable than these species here. That's what drives a chemical reaction. You say, oh, this happens because the products are more stable than the reactants. So acids are proton donors and bases are always the opposite, proton acceptors. Another definition, the Lewis one that's useful is acids are, I remember it's always the opposite, proton donors, electron acceptors. And bases are uh, proton acceptors, electron donors. That won't come into place much, much for you now, but it's a really useful definition because that applies to everything. Because you'll see things in the future that don't have hydrogen ions on them and they're acids. So how could it be a proton donor? 
The proton donor is not a complete definition. So something like this can be an acid, right? There's no proton there, but it can accept electrons. It acts as an acid and that's what it does. It grabs electrons, can act as an acid. All right, so HCl is a proton donor. In this case, water is acting like a base. Depending on what it's paired with, it's amphoteric, or if you want to say amphiprotic, Amphoteric means dual natured amphiprotic. Oh, that's not amphiprotic. Uh, that would be two, two protons. What's the other word? I can't remember. Is that it? I think it was on one of the pages in your book or on a slide somewhere, something like that. It might show up somewhere else. There's another term that you used. Anyway, so uh, well, water can act as an acid or a base, basically, depending on what it's paired with. So a neutralization reaction then would be when an acid and base come together, in this case, sodium hydroxide's a base, it's a proton acceptor, and it's the hydroxide specifically, that's the base part of it, that's accepting that right proton and forming water. And this will actually be a strong electrolyte. So in solution, it'll be like this, but this is a molecular equation. So it's just showing you there's sodium chloride aqueous, but realize that ultimately in solution that will be sodium ions and chloride ions. So this is an acid-base reaction, it's neutralization and that they neutralize each other. Because when they don't neutralize each other and you get this, this affects the pH. And this is something we'll talk about in Gen Chem 2 a lot, pH. That's what you're measuring when you're measuring pH. You're measuring the hydronium ion concentration in solution. The electrode you're using or the pH paper is sensitive to that. Questions? So your book glosses over this a little bit more than the old edition. Um, can be pretty useful sometimes. I'm gonna spend a little time on this here. So you can write multiple equations for a reaction when we're dealing with things like electrolytes. You can write the molecular equation like this, but then you can write the overall ionic equation. And the overall ionic equation means that you're writing all of your strong electrolytes as ions, the way they occur in solution. So strong bas basses, <laughs> strong, strong. <laughs> if you're a fisherman, maybe you like strong basses, but strong bases and acids are strong electrolytes. So when you write them in an ionic equation, you have to write them as ions. So as you see, we've written, instead of HCl, we've written H positive Cl negative because that's the way it occurs in solution. It's a strong electrolyte. We've written a strong base like sodium hydroxide as ions because it's a strong electrolyte. And on the right, we write sodium chloride as ions because that's a strong electrolyte. It's a very soluble salt. We'll get the solubility at the end of the chapter. You'll be able to know which ones are strong electrolytes, which are not. But you leave water intact because that's not a strong electrolyte. That's a molecular compound. Yes, it forms ions in small amounts. And we'll talk about that a little bit in Gen Chem 2, but it's not a strong electrolyte. So you leave that. So I ultimately cross out anything that's the same on both sides. Chloride, chloride, sodium, sodium. And you leave everything else and you get your net ionic equation, which is your chemical reaction. This is why net ionic equations are important. They tell you whether a reaction occurs or not. You see, because you have to look for something to be formed. We used to do a lab like this. I'm not sure if you're doing anything like this, but um, for a chemical the reaction to occur, something has to happen where you form a product. 
And that product usually is going to be a non-electrolyte like wood or something like that, a molecular compound, some sort of gas or some sort of precipitate, okay? Something has to happen. So for instance, if I told you I took sodium chloride and I put it into solution, water, and then I added some calcium bromide, okay? Does a chemical reaction occur? Well, the way you would do that, you'd say, okay, well, let's see, I got sodium ions plus chloride ions because they're strong electrolytes plus calcium ions plus bromide ions. And on the right, well, all you do is you switch, switch partners and we'll get to this when we get to solubility, but you're not forming any water. You're gonna wind up with a bunch of ions still on the other side and everything's gonna cancel out, which tells you it's not a chemical reaction. You're just mixing two salts. That's all you're doing. All you have is a mixture. Something has to form and happen. And we haven't covered solubility yet, so you might not know that yet, but certainly you're not forming water, right? And in some reactions, you can form gases like CO2, right? But there's no gas that's gonna form here. So the only possibility would be a precipitate. And there are no precipitates that form here. And you'll, you'll understand why that is in a bit when we uh, cover uh, the solubility guidelines. So that would not be a chemical reaction at all. It would just be, you, you mix two salts together. That's all you did. You made a homogeneous mixture. But this is a reaction because you're forming water molecules. Even though this whole system is in water, you're still forming more water as part of a, a reacting species. I mean, sorry, as, as part of a product. All right, so. You don't have to memorize anything because everything's open book, open note, but you got to recognize your strong acids because if it's not on this list, you'll treat it as a weak acid. And the reason you need to know that is you got to know what your strong electrolytes are, right? You're going to have to be able to predict and write ionic equations and look for products. So you're going to want to uh, look at these. You got HCl, your halogens basically, except for HF. HF is not a strong acid, the bonding is too strong does not completely ionize in solution or dissociate in solution. So it's a weak acid. Weak acid means weak electrolyte. But otherwise, your halogens and then nitric, sulfuric, and per perchloric. It's the only ones you're responsible for as strong acids. Now, sulfuric is a diprotic. It's got two protons there. It can actually dissociate twice. The second one's weaker than the first one, but still it has two protons to donate. So we call that a diprotic acid. You have triprotic acids. Phosphoric acid is a triprotic acid. It's not a strong acid, but it's triprotic. It's got three protons it can donate. Weak acids are weak electrolytes that only partially dissociate in aqueous solution. The words dissociate and ionize, there are specifics for those, but they're used somewhat interchangeably. And I can never remember which one is appropriate when, and it seems to be using dissociate for this. And I usually think of salts as so dissociating from crystals this being ionization, but anyway, I use them pretty much interchangeably. So um, the one organic one that you should get familiar with is acetic acid. And we write it like this. I like to write it like this because it shows you the acidic hydrogen. Because you could have wrote it like this, right? CH4CO2, right? And you don't know which one's the hydrogen. That this structurally looks like this. You know your lowest structures. You got a carbon there. It's going to have four bonds, three hydrogens off of that, bonded to another carbon, right? And then you got an OH group. And then you got this double bonded carbon there. That's acetic acid. And that hydrogen over there is acidic. The other three are not acidic. They don't come off. You don't typically see hydrogens bound to carbons 
are not acidic, okay? But bound to an oxygen can very well be acidic. It doesn't have to be because you've learned about, you know, things like this. That's ethanol. That's an alcohol. That is not an acidic hydrogen. You can't be expected to recognize that right now. In organic chemistry, you'll learn that this is key to making this an acidic hydrogen. So acetic acid, the only organic acid you're familiar with. Carbonic acid is an important weak acid. There's hydrofluoric. H2S is not nearly as important, but H3O4 is pretty common and important. Carbonic acid is part of the carbonate buffering system. The carbonate buffering system is the same buffer that's in your blood. It is also in natural waters. Okay, It's what buffers your your blood pH at a very specific range. Um, forget exactly, 7.4 to 7. Point, it's very narrow too. And then it's the same buffer that's in aquatic systems and lakes and rivers and all of that. That's one of those pieces of evolution that says that life evolved from water. You know, we have the exact same buffer system that's in water in our blood. Just one small piece of information and evidence. Strong and weak bases. Well, we can have the same discussion we had about acids, right? Strong bases completely dissociate. Weak bases partially. Now, this is an important weak base because when you look at it, you don't see a hydroxide like you do here. But look what it does. It generates the hydroxide by stealing the hydrogen from the water to form the ammonium cation, which is a polyatomic ion that you're asked to look at and familiarize yourself back in chapter two. And it was um, the only one that was positively charged in that polyatomic list that you learned, like sulfate, nitrate, the ammonium one was the only positive. So ammonia is a base. It's a basic cleaner, right? Using cleaning a lot. Sodium hydroxide is one of the main ingredients in oven cleaner. Pretty strong base. Strong bases and acids can be dangerous, it can, you know, attack your skin, things like that. Use appropriate. Um, that's the word I was looking for. Amphiprotic. Amphoteric is more general. Amphiprotic is specifically for bases or acids. So water's amphiprotic. I might have even said that, but I thought I just kind of stopped myself there. I thought it was wrong. But anyway. Um, so water, when it's paired up with HCl, acts as a base, but when paired up as ammonia, it acts as an acid, right? Because it's donating that proton to the, to the, the ammonia base. Questions? Good. <laughs> All right. Titration. In the titration, the concentration of solute in a sample, which is down here, this is my sample, is determined by reacting with the standard solution of known concentration. This is my standard solution. And you'll do titrations, I don't think until Gen 10 2 in the lab. And you'll use a burette to deliver that nice, accurate volumetric glassware. So someone can come to me with a sample and say, hey, how much, uh, how much acid is in this sample? Well, I can titrate it with a base. And knowing the reaction, I can use my stoichiometry. So I guess there is a little bit of stoichiometry here. I can use my stoichiometry to figure out what the concentration was of that original sample. Because keep in mind that, oh man, I wish they didn't use H2SO4 yet here. Um, but anyway, if I have one molar HCl and one molar sodium hydroxide, 
and have 50 mils of each, right? You can obviously see that they'll completely neutralize each other, right? And you'll have nothing but water and salt left over. So basically what you do is you add an indicator that changes color when the solution goes from, in this case, let's say our sample is, does it say, doesn't say which one's which, we can just say the sample is acid. It'll change color when it goes from acid to neutral. So you know that's the, the end point of your titration and you know you've completely neutralized this with the sodium hydroxide you've added from here. And then once you know that, you can do the calculation and say, oh, well, I know my standard solution was 0 0.1 molar and I delivered 10 milliliters, right? And my sample was 10 milliliters. So therefore my unknown acid must have been point, you see what I'm saying? 0 0.1 milliliter. That's for this right up here. These two, this has a two here. You gotta keep in mind, that's gonna affect your calculation. This is the diprotic acid. That's why I wish they didn't start with HTSO4. But I'll show you in a second, a, uh, a calculation where we look at both of those. So there's the indicator. And it's close to the equivalence point. The equivalence point is the actual stoichiometric point. This right here, stoichiometrically, when these two are equal, exactly. Okay? But the indicator, I'm sorry, the end point, as indicated by the indicator, is as close to that as possible. So you pick an indicator that's going to change at the right point. Now, you can do this with a pH meter. You don't need an indicator. But also, the indicators are still pretty common. Because the difference typically is so small that it becomes irrelevant because of the pH change. I can't show you that right now. It really comes back into play in Gen Chem 2. When you look at a titration curve between a strong acid and a strong base, literally one drop can make the difference of the pH changing tremendously. So. Um, the small difference between the indicator and the endpoint and the equivalence point becomes irrelevant to like, you know, if you're just calculating two sig figs anyway. All right, so now, if 30.34 milliliters of a 0.135 molar solution of hydrochloric acid are required to neutralize 25 milliliters of a sodium hydroxide solution, what is the molarity of the sodium hydroxide solution, okay? This is the question. This is the titration question. So you have to realize that if I've neutralized it, that means I've added an equal number of moles, right? That's what you're doing. Oh, I'm sorry, it's right here. Equal number of moles have to be added to get it neutralized. So I can say to myself, well, I've got 0.13, Five moles per liter of HCl times 30.34. Oops, I should put that in liters. That's what 30.34 times 10 to minus three liters, right? I'll put it in liters. That's how many moles, right? Dimensional analysis, that's how many moles of HCl were required, and I had a 25 mil sample. So if I just do times, and this is what confuses students, I can never figure out how to do this. That's, this is equal, okay, now let's do this, let's do this. Well, I can leave that there actually. Um, times one mole of sodium hydroxide, for every one mole of HCl, what this allows me to do now is say, okay, well, there's my moles of HCl. Now I'm to moles of sodium hydroxide, right? Times, and this is what confuses people, one over 0 0.025 liters of sodium hydroxide. And students are always like, well, what's the one? Well, no, I'm just dividing by 25 mils because I've got moles and I want the molarity. I just do it by dimensional analysis. So I'm multiplying by, the by one over. But you're dividing by the volume because your answer right here 
at this point is moles of sodium hydroxide. So how do you get molarity of sodium hydroxide? Divided by the volume in liters, or in my case, multiply by one over because I'm doing it by dimensional analysis. Did you do it? Still doing it? Okay. I don't have the answer, so, so we need to get the answer, but, uh, and that's your answer. And if you figure it up, we've got, we use more, right, volume, which means the concentration of the, the unknown should be higher than our titrant, right? It should be greater than 0.135. Did I do it yet? 0.135 times, you can just do 0 0.03034 divided by 0 0.025. What? What was that? It's 37. <laughs> it can't be. Did you do 30.34 times 10 to the minus 3? What'd you get? Uh, 0.1638. What is it? 0.1638. That sounds about right. 0.1638. Someone else got that right. Okay. Equal to 0 0.1638. And that's a molarity. Did you figure out what you did wrong? It's probably the way you're putting in the 30.34. Don't do times 10 to remember do second EE negative three. That might be creating a problem. You're looking at the numbers, think about it. This is the whole part of that coast. Think about it. We use 30 mils to neutralize 25 mils, which means the original sample should be slightly larger than the 0.135. And that's where we got 0 0.1638. Still not getting it? What the heck are you doing? <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> oh, I got it. Okay, there you go. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Does everybody see what we did? All right. Questions? Yeah, so. Yes, but the problem is the next question, you can't use that. And that's why I don't teach that. It really is, right? It is. MV, right? Um, equals, and then here's the M, right? This is the, I'm sorry, this is the V. That's all we've done. We've done molarity times volume divided by volume, which is the MV, V, and V. Problem is this right here. When you have a diprotic acid, if you do MV, you won't get the right answer because here, now we have a diprotic where this is the two. So now you got to say, okay, we have to do the same thing. We get started with molarity. So we got 0 0.0973 moles per liter of sodium hydroxide times. 0 0.01845 liters, right? Sodium hydroxide times two moles of H2SO4 for every, I'm sorry, I did it backwards, one mole, one for every two of the other one. Take my stoichiometry, this is the stoichiometry part. One mole of H2SO4 for every two moles of sodium hydroxide, right? Times, and then we've got uh, one over, what was it, 15 mils, 0 0.015 liters. Sorry, that's really sloppy. I can't write when I'm standing sometimes. Sorry, I'm doing it all over. 0 0.079.73 moles of sodium hydroxide per liter times 0 0.01845 liters. 
times one mole of H2SO4 for every two moles of sodium hydroxide. Looking at this right now, I'm at I'm at moles of H2SO4, which is what I want, times um, one over 0 0.01500 liters. So that's why you can't do the M1V1 all the time. You can use it as long as you recognize once you've got the stoichiometry, if it's two to one, you've got to divide by two in the end. Yeah, and then you could just do, you could take your answer from M1V1 divided by two and you'd have the correct answer. Okay. But just realize that sometimes it could be the reverse. It could be a, a uh, HCl and magnesium hydroxide, which is two hydroxides. So the two will be on the top now instead of the bottom. That's why I like to just do it as dimensional analysis and just say, okay, no big deal. This will always be in every one of my calculations for titrations, right? And I'll just go from whatever moles I'm trying to get from. This is, this is my titrate that's in the burette, what I know, to what I'm after, the unknown. And then this will allow me to convert between those two. That's the dimensional analysis. But basically, yeah, it's kind of basically the same math as M1V1 equals M2V2. That's all we're going to do with titrations. So as long as you can do this type of, and this really is just like a neutralization, right? I mean, it's a titration, but that's what you're doing effectively. You're neutralizing either an acid or a base sample using a, a, an indicator to tell you when you've neutralized it. Questions? All right, so in a precipitation reaction, soluble reactants form a product that has limited solubility. So we have lead nitrate, which is a clear solution, and it's being added to sodium iodide, which is also a clear solution. And this yellow precipitate forms. It's really a pretty yellow precipitate. Now we'll eventually settle to the bottom of the beaker. Once everything settles, the liquid will be clear at the top and you'll have this precipitate at the bottom, which means it's not dissolved. It's a separate phase at the bottom. When something's dissolved, it's dispersed throughout the solution. This is no different than rain. We had, some nice, we had a lot of rain yesterday, right? The, the solvent is air, right? And I'm sorry, well, I should say the solvent is nitrogen gas. And there's a bunch of solutes in that, which include oxygen gas. The nitrogen gas is 78% of the atmosphere, not oxygen, right? That's the major gas. Oxygen gas is a solute. Water vapor is a solute, right? The water vapor comes together, forms critical mass and falls out of the sky. That's a precipitation reaction, right? Water is precipitating from the air, no different. This bond is strong. These come together and they fall out of solution, doesn't interact well with water, falls out of solution. But the sodium nitrate is still aqueous. That's a strong electrolyte. So here's the molecular equation. Lead nitrate, is that lead? What, what is the proper name for that lead nitrate there? Lead two nitrate, right? Because nitrate is minus one and there's two of them. Lead two nitrate plus sodium iodide gives me lead iodide solid. That's my precipitate plus sodium nitrate. A lot of these reactions, you just swap partners. That's all you do, right? Take the nitrate and put it with the sodium, take the iodine and put it with the lead and see what happens. See if you get a precipitate. And you're going to know that by learning your solubility guidelines in a second here. Let's write the net, the total ionic equation. Well, lead nitrate is aqueous, strong electrolyte, so it's low writing. There's a mistake I just realized. 
That should not be a two there. I have no idea what that is. Lead ions, just PB plus. Oh, I'm sorry. It's supposed to be a superscript. That's what it is. That two should be a superscript. Okay, they just had it as a subscript. Lead two ions, right? Plus two and plus four are the common charges for lead. Two nitrate, because I've got this strong electrolyte here and I've got two nitrates. Two sodium ions, because I've got a two out in front, two iodide ions. On the right, well, this is a solid. You don't write a solid as ions, it's a solid. You leave it together, just like we left molecular water together. This tells you a chemical reaction is happening. If this had been sodium, uh, use chloride, is that? Uh, if this had been, yeah, lead precipitates with a lot of things, so I can't come up with an example. But if this had been, if this had been lead nitrate. You wouldn't have a chemical reaction, right? You just have lead and nitrate ions in there and sodium ions in there. But now we've got this precipitate, so leave that together. But the sodium nitrate, that's aqueous. That's very soluble. So you write it as ions, cross everything out. There's your chemical reaction, your net ionic equation. And that is lead ions combined with iodide ions to form lead iodide. That's your chemical reaction which tells you what the others we call are spectator ions, because it doesn't matter if this had been sodium nitrate or maybe it would be potassium nitrate. The reaction's the same. That's just the spectator of the sodium. You see? So anything that cancels out is a spectator. And it doesn't matter if we had used potassium nitrate, the reaction's the same. I'm sorry, not, I'm sorry, potassium iodide, not over here on the right, potassium iodide. Potassium nitrate's a product. I mean, sodium nitrate's the product. Okay. Questions? So, this is where this comes into play. This is the table. Now, most of what we do in general chemistry is guidelines, not rules. <laughs> Just like we gave you guidelines for figuring out Lewis structures. Sometimes it works, the formal charges, sometimes it doesn't. They're guidelines to help you. And they'll vary these guidelines depending on which textbook and who you're talking to. I always tell my students pretty much, I believe that everything is soluble in everything. It might be in an incredibly small amount, and in some cases we can't even measure it. You drop a block of iron into water, <laughs> it's pretty insoluble. I'm willing to bet that there's small amount of iron ions that will come off into solution, but we can't detect them because the amount is so small. So when someone says something's insoluble, okay, it's just a guideline they're using. So for instance, I can look at two different handbooks. The Merck index will say that benzene is insoluble in water. An environmental handbook will say that benzene is soluble in water at 1800 parts per million. Because <laughs> it is. It depends on who you're talking to and, and what they consider soluble. As environmental chemists, I work in trace quantities. So things that a lot of people consider insoluble in water, we consider trace pollutants. They're soluble in water. And sometimes they're, they're toxic at, at low levels. So it's important to know. So these are just guidelines based on whatever they're the writers in the textbook decided is the cutoff for their solubility, whatever it's like 10 to minus three molar or something like that they use. So one thing you learn right off the bat, cations of group one metals are soluble. Doesn't matter what you pair them with, okay? Sodium, potassium, they're always soluble. Doesn't matter if it's potassium chloride, potassium nitrate, sodium phosphate, they're always soluble. Now remember, solubility is pairs. You can't talk about the solubility of just sodium ions. It's sodium paired with something. Is it soluble? Is sodium chloride soluble? 
is potassium phosphate soluble. You have to talk about the pairs, right? So also you'll see that these three anions are pretty much always soluble. Nitrate, the perchlorate ion, and the acetate ion. That's the acetic acid uh, conjugate base. You didn't, they didn't even introduce those terms, conjugate acid and base. I guess that comes in Gen Chem 2. Um, changing the textbook messes me up a little bit because I get so used to the other one. But, uh, and I forget where certain things are. But so, so nitrate is always soluble. This is one big problem with um, fertilizers and pollution, like eutrophication and nutrients in pollution, nutrients in water waste. So my students in uh, my environmental chem class right now are giving presentations. We just had a presentation on nutrient pollution and they talked a lot about nitrate. It's so soluble that it's in our fertilizer. If it rains, oh, right into the sewers, right into your rivers, right? Because it's so soluble. And when we say something is soluble, it means it doesn't have any pairs that it, that's attracted to that's going to pull it out of solution and precipitate it. And that goes for like soil too. It's the same, same species are in the soil. There's nothing for the nitrate to pair with in the soil. So it just runs into your water. Now these are soluble, but there's a few exceptions to them. Your halogens are pretty much soluble, chloride, bromide, iodide, except when they pair with silver, copper, the mercury dimer, just means it's two mercuries together, and lead. And sulfates are soluble, except for the, 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 the group two metals down lower, and then mercury and lead again. And, you know, there's tons of chemistry going on here, so let's not even bother trying to tackle why silver chloride isn't soluble, you know, um, but sodium chloride is, okay? Um, and then compounds containing the following anions are considered to have limited solubility. Fluoride, chromates in there, except those, and you don't even really need this exception because we've already said up here that these are always soluble. So it's kind of redundant. That's the exception to everything. Group one and the ammonium cation. Those are always soluble. Insoluble. We just did lead. Uh, no, we did lead iodide. We did lead iodide, right? There you go. There's the precipitate. We did lead iodide or lead sulfate, was it? Was it sulfate? Oh, I died, right. Yeah. And well, that's sulfate, sulfide. I keep saying sulfate. That's sulfide. Sulfide ion is very insoluble with metals specifically. Exception, group one, you know. Okay, so that gives you an idea about solubility of things. And it has to do with bonding and the strength of this bonding. And the last I'll end with is this matrix right here which is just kind of a shortened way of trying to give you some, you know, give you some uh, knowledge about some of these groups and how soluble they are. So use this as necessary. We'll do that at another time. But you notice right off the bat, the nitrates up top, soluble. And those halogens are pretty soluble, except for one paired with things on the right there. So that's the way this is structured. Questions? Okay.